All right. Hello, NaNoWriMo. I am Grant Faulkner, executive of NaNoWriMo. And thank you so much for joining us today uh, for this discussion about this wonderful but intimidating next step of the creative journey, publishing and self-publishing in particular. And, and for me, it's intimidating because you, you have to shift out of that, that role of being author into being what our guest Joanna Penn calls an authorpreneur. Uh, you have to you have to be uh, you know think about managing a book editor and a cover designer and a book formatter and uh, think about where you're going to publish and print your book and sell it. All the, all those kinds of things. So it's a lot a lot to learn. Uh, definitely, and the landscape keeps shifting. Uh, but fortunately, we have our guest who's going to make it all you know less daunting for us, more friendly. She's super friendly herself, and she's a whirlwind of energy. I'm just going to read. You know, there there are a hundred things to know about Joanna. I'm just going to read a handful of them all very impressive. Uh, Joanna has written 30 plus books and sold over 500,000, sold over 500,000 copies in 86 countries, I just heard, which is amazing. Um, some of those books are great writer guides, such as Successful Self-Publishing, to complement this uh, webinar, uh, The Successful Author Mindset and How to Be an Author Entrepreneur. And some of those are thrillers too. She's published under the name of J.F. Penn, and one of those thrillers was actually written in NaNoWriMo way back in 2009. And although she only wrote 200,000, 20,000 words, only wrote 200,000 words. That's what happens when you do NaNoWriMo. It's only 200,000 words. She wrote 20,000 words that year, but that became her first published novel. And uh, Joanna is one of the most entrepreneurial authors I know. Uh, check out her site, thecreativepen.com, which has been voted in the top 100 sites for writers by Writers Digest. And she also hosts the very popular podcast, The Creative Pen, which uh, includes weekly interviews, interviews and information on writing and creativity, publishing options, and book marketing. So welcome, Joanna. Oh, thanks for having me, Grant. I'm excited to be here and uh, answer the questions this evening. Absolutely. I can't wait to dive in and learn a lot myself. And I just want to tell people who are uh, viewing us that I, I'll interview Joanna for 20, 30 minutes, and we are also going to open it up to questions from you. So please put your, your questions in the chat area, and our trusty producer, Catherine Grip, will pass them on to me to ask Joanna. So hopefully we'll get all your questions answered. Um, but Joanna, just to start, one thing about NaNoWriMo, I think of NaNoWriMo writers as being sort of, uh, they're entrepreneurial in their DNA in a way. And, and I say that because um, NaNoWriMo encourages a DIY mindset, a uh, do-it-yourself mindset. Uh, and that's because we think that the best way to learn to write a novel is to actually do it, just to dive in and learn by doing. And I think, you know, self-publishing is different, but it still has that entrepreneurial can-do spirit. And so I was wondering, did, did your experience with NaNoWriMo influence your entrepreneurial spirit at all, or were you just a born entrepreneur? <laughs> well, I, I don't think anyone's a born anything. I think we have to learn everything. Yeah. Uh, but I actually had been running businesses for about a decade before I did that first NaNoWriMo. And I'd ri already written three nonfiction books before I wrote um, that first novel. So uh, what NaNoWriMo helped me do more than anything was get over a mental block about writing fiction because I was very happy being an entrepreneur, entrepreneur around nonfiction. I was a speaker, you know, I was doing consulting. I was doing all these different things, but I was petrified of fiction and I couldn't see where fiction could fit into my creative life or also my business life. So that's what that first NaNoWriMo did for me. It blew away my block around Good. fiction and really helped me get into it that way. That's great to hear. That's what we're about, blowing away those obstacles. So great to hear it. Um, well, you know, one, one of the questions I hear most frequently from nano authors is, you know, they get to the stage it's where they've written their novel, they've revised their novel, they're ready to think about publishing. And of course, there's this question, do you publish traditionally or whether you self-publish? And they're, 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 they're vastly different or they have significant differences. So it's a big decision. And so how would you go about figuring out what's best for you? Right. Well, the, the question and what I would say is stop and think. <laughs> this, this, and this is very hard because I know everyone's like, oh, quick, I need the next step. Yeah. But you need to stop and think about what you want to achieve. And that is a really big question. And that will also change over your author journey. So and many of us write me a lot of books. Uh, so don't you don't have to think that that one book is everything. But let's assume it is your first book. And you're thinking, okay, what do I want with this? If you want to win the Pulitzer Prize for fiction, <laughs> or mm -hmm. the Man Booker Prize, or a literary prize in general, then I would suggest you definitely look at traditional publishing, because most prizes are actually 
totally closed to self-published writers. So that, that would be one extreme, a real, I want to have critical acclaim, that is my goal. Um, on the other side of the spectrum is the, I want to make money with my book. I actually would like to make money in my pocket next month. <laughs> yeah. Now that is actually possible with self-publishing. Obviously there are lots of steps and you may make 99 cents <laughs> or you might make more than that. So both of those extremes, obviously there are gradations in the middle, but uh, you also have to think about who you are as a personality. As I said, I'd been running projects. I'd been running my own business. I know how to run projects. And to be a successful self-publisher, you need to know how to do that. And you need to be happy with marketing or at least learn how to do marketing. And we can all learn how to do these things. Whereas if you get a publisher, you will get a lot more help with doing that kind of thing. Although, to be honest, these days, most traditional publishers want authors who know how to market. So a lot of this will be to do with confidence and as we all know you know you're not usually very confident at the beginning I mean, in fact many of us we all still suffer with self-doubt every single day so that never goes away but it's as you said about the sort of try it um, process if you are someone who's happy to jump in and do NaNoWriMo it may be that you are the type of personality who will enjoy self-publishing so what I would say is those two questions like what do you want to achieve with that book and also who are you as a personality what do you enjoy doing um do you have an audience already you know maybe you're on instagram all the time maybe you uh, have a podcast maybe you have a youtube channel already in that case you have a lot of the things already built in that might help you succeed with self-publishing so those are questions to consider but the main thing is shifting your mind from me 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 to the reader the reader the reader and the agent and the publisher if you're going that way because you have to now kind of switch your brain around and that's very it's very difficult to do but you have to pitch either pitch to an agent and a publisher or pitch to a reader so you and that's the switch from you internally to you externally yeah that's really interesting one thing i always think about with um as self as self publishing you know self publishing's come a long way in the last 10 years and i i just read it gosh i think it's 1.7 million Books were self-published last year, so there's a lot of books. Um, I, I always tell people that it, part of the path is if you're if you're looking for an agent and looking for that traditional publishing journey, which is great, um, it it takes a long time. You have to be very patient. I mean, you might get an agent right away, but it still takes a long time after you find that agent to sell the book and publishing it. Whereas, like self-publishing gives you you can you can publish more more quickly you can keep up with your output i guess and i, I always say that that's something to consider um what, what do you think about that yeah speed is definitely a thing and um i mean obviously NaNoWriMo is um fiction but there's um you know if, if you're writing non-fiction i often think it's it's people who write nonfiction want to get their books out faster because a lot of the work is time specific whereas novels and stories can be you know have more longevity around the material so timing is definitely one thing although I would you know we'll talk about some of the prerequisites but you know it does take time to edit and you know don't just upload as we always say don't upload your book mm -hmm. straight after nano yeah. do some editing but um yeah timing is, is definitely one thing but the the biggest thing cited by people is control. So many, um, and this is an important point, many professional authors now are choosing to self-publish, to go indie, as well as work with traditional publishing because they have more control over their creative outputs. And so they might do one series under one name with a publisher and another series under another name as an indie, or you know do a different series under the same name or come in later and do a different book. So it's all, it's all we're in a mix and match environment really. So after that first book and you're starting to write more, if you want to do this, for um, your career, for a living, or just because you want to write a lot of books, then yeah, time is one, control is another, speed. Um, and as I said, also money, because um, if you are successful self-publishing, the type of numbers you have to sell as an independent are a lot lower than what a traditional publisher will expect a book to sell in order to be a success. And that yeah. definition of success is super different uh, for everyone and in every genre and in every country, but um, everyone has a number in their mind. Yeah, good. You have to set your own number in a way, uh, but your publisher will set, set one for you, definitely. Uh, I hear this question a lot. Um, people worry that if they take the self-publishing route that that automatically kind of closes the door on traditional publishing. Is that the case, would you say? Uh, definitely not 
for a career. But what I would say is there was a time about seven, eight years ago when if a book did well as an indie book, uh, publishers picked it up. I mean, the, the most famous example, of course, is Fifty Shades of Grey, oh. uh, which did go on and become this huge success. There are still books that this happened to. Um, uh, yeah, there are lots of books this still happens to. But mainly what I see is a shift in that if um, an author breaks out as an indie often what will happen is a publisher will want something new from them. So there is a kind of cult of the new, uh, although there are also now deals with authors for their entire backlist. I'm also seeing this with um, publishing deals going, OK, you're successful. You've got this series. We'll just buy everything. So we're definitely not in a binary world of self-publishing versus indie. We're definitely much more in a mixed, um, it's called hybrid publishing these days, one of the terms that's used. But but um, what you've got to remember is that publishers and agents are business people. Their aim is, yes, they love books and they love literature and culture, but they're also out to make money. And so if a book is doing well, if an author is savvy and knows what they're doing, then the publisher is going to approach them. So, for example, um, I've sold books in uh, you know foreign rights deals. I do my own in English, but um, in foreign rights, you know, happy to license. And there's authors, for example, a friend of mine, Mark Dawson, who's just licensed his print books here in the UK, uh, whereas he self-publishes all his uh, e-books um, uh, and audio. Oh, no, he's got some audio deals as well. So you, basically, you can mix and match by book, by series, by format, by country, uh, which is called territory in publishing, you know, these different territories. So no, it's not at all like that anymore. Huh, interesting. Um, you know, you, you mentioned earlier that, that you, you want to dispel that notion that people, you know, right after writing their books, they should upload it and publish it right away. That some, there needs to be some work done after writing the book, definitely. And so I'm curious what your, your take is on getting your book edited before self-publishing it, um, you know, and who, who you go for. How do you get your, your novel edited? Yeah, sure. And look, I think w what we've also got to look at is the different scales of what people call self-publishing. So I don't actually call myself uh, a self-published author. I call myself an independent author, mm -hmm. an indie author, because I work with about 13 different professionals in my multi-six-figure business uh, as a creative entrepreneur. So I basically run a small press. I have a small press called Curl Up Press. Uh, it's got its own website. Uh, you know, I, do, I have my own ISBNs, you know, all of that. So basically, but some people just have one book and they want to put it out there and they just want to say, I made this. And that is entirely valid as well. So what we're saying here is if you want your if you want to be uh, to have a career really as an author, if you want to take this further, if you want to say I made this and I'm and I'm investing in that because it is an investment to hire an editor. Um, you know, they, these are specialist people who will help your book become better. Now, I use an editor on every book. Um, I have a different editor for fiction than nonfiction. I also use a proofreader. Um, I've had structural edits. So basically, these are professionals who can make your product the best it can be. And it's a bit like dating <laughs> because the person you might hire for your first editor for your first book probably isn't the person you're going to end up with as a long-term editor. One of the nice things about being indie, because we pay editors directly, is you can hold on to an editor for the long term, whereas many authors find in publishing um, companies that their editor moves companies and they end up orphaned, as it's known as, uh, whereas I've kept my fiction editor now for what nearly a decade I guess <laughs> uh, oh, wow. which is which is great so what I would say is there are lots of organizations that can help you find editors um uh, and authors will recommend them. Obviously, you can look at the back of people's books. Uh, I have a page on my website. It's it's in the free ebook, which I'm sure we'll be linking to in the, the show notes. Um, and essentially, then you can check out their website. Really important. Uh, again, a bit like dating. You want to see that they like the same things you do. So please do not send your paranormal romance to a literary editor. You will get slammed. But if you send it to a paranormal romance editor, they may well love it and help you make it the best paranormal romance possible. Whereas if you've written a literary novel, sure, send it to a literary editor. Now, um, the cost for that is going to depend on how long your book is, but also the skill of a writer. So um, at, at the very beginning, I mean, we all have to admit this, you know, you get better 
her book. So your first book, unfortunately, is going to need the most work, <laughs> which, um, you know, it, it means you have to invest a bit more at the beginning. But what else are you going to do? I mean, you start doing this as a hobby and eventually it might be professional if you want it to be. But yes, um, those are some tips, I guess, on um, editing. Yeah. You know, I'm curious. Um, and thanks for making that distinction that, that you know, while we're talking a lot about the professional indie author here, uh, I also want to respect people who who want to self-publish on, on, a, on, I guess, a smaller, more intimate and more casual basis, which is which is great. I've, I've actually done that myself just to get copies of my novel and give them to friends and family. And it's very gratifying. Um, I'm curious because, you know, for me, and I think for most people, hiring an editor is a big leap, you know, just in terms of, well, mainly financially. So you want to make sure you get the right person. You also want to make sure you get the right person at the right time. And uh, I guess I guess one of my questions is, is, when do you know your book is ready for that next step? You know, like I, I have a novel now that I think I've reached the end meaning final revision at least three times. <laughs> and, and I've gone back to it and revised it again. So I think as a writer, we can easily lose perspective or not know when the timing is right. Yes, and this is one of the problems with being an independent because you don't have a deadline. So if you have signed a traditional publishing contract, you have a time when that book is due. But if you are an independent, you have to be someone who is project centered. So I have 30 plus books because I am very good at projects mm -hmm. and I'm good at starting and I'm good at finishing. The middle bit's difficult, like it, the middle is difficult, but I know how to finish. And this is the issue. Your question is a great question. And I know authors who have like 30 plus books and none of them are published because they cannot get over that and that finishing energy moment. But basically how I how, what I do is I do set a deadline. So with that first novel, I did NaNoWriMo in that November 2009, and I realized I didn't know enough about writing a novel. So I then did year of the novel. I was living in Australia at the time. I spent 2010 writing and kind of editing that book with the aim of publishing on my birthday in March 2011. So I set a goal from the day one and I work towards that goal. Now I know some people type B people, I'm type A, so I'm like goal, goal orientated, but I think you have to, you have to set your own deadline. You have to pretend you have a contract. So I was like, I want it by my birthday, um, which is mid-March, we're coming up to my birthday soon. Um, but I actually, I was a month late with that first book, but hey, I was a month late and I still made it. And then I've gone on to write way more books um, since then. And if I hadn't have set that goal, and I set a goal for every book, um, so I know, okay, I have, and then I work backwards. I'm like, okay, I have to finish the first draft by this date. And then I do my own um, first edit. Then if I feel my first full edit is good enough, which often for nonfiction, particularly, I'm pretty slick on nonfiction, I will send that off. But with my novel, I'll be like, okay, rest it a bit, then do another self edit. After my second self edit, I will normally send it to my editor. Or in some cases, I've sent it to her quite early when I'm like, this isn't working and I don't know how to fix it that's another time where you might want an editor or a structural edit. Um, and then after I do my um, my updates and things, my restructural, whatever, my line edits, I'll send it to the proofreader before I publish. So that would be my tip, is you really do need to try and set a contract with yourself and set your timelines or, you know, 10 years will pass, which is, <laughs> it have passes yeah. very quickly and you still haven't got it out there. So Grant, you're going to set a date for this book. <laughs> well, I, I have, I have set dates that I've hit. It, it's all been that, um, I've reached a point after what I considered the final revision where I realized that something, uh, relatively significant wasn't working, you know? So this might mm. be, I've been trying to get it traditionally published too. So, so I've sent it out and, and faced rejection with it and then kind of gotten a new idea and done a lot of work with it. So, um, and you know, I mean, my thing is, is that maybe, I, I mean, I haven't hired an editor to look at it. So maybe I should have done that a draft or two ago and it would have made it all the easier. You know, there are a lot of considerations with that. Um, so, but, but I like the, con I mean, definitely the contract approach. I mean, we believe in goals and deadlines. That's at the heart of everything we do. Um, but if I think it's it's good to remember that it's not just about drafting when the goal and deadline work for you. It's, it's at all stages, really. Um, otherwise, like you say, you can just fritter away time. And yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, definitely. Definitely. And it, I mean, the other thing is, I don't know, there's a quote, I can't remember who said it, you know, books are never finished, they're just abandoned or poems or whatever it is about. Yeah. But, you know, I and the thing is, like Stone of Fire, uh, the, the book I started that first NaNoWriMo, I did a re-edit on that in 2014. Um, and it had been out five years. Uh, and in 2014, the box set hit the New York Times and the USA Today bestseller list. Um, now, we never think our books are, are good enough. Uh, and I go back now and I'm like, oh, I re I'd really like to redo that. And I'm like, seriously, you can't go back and redo every single book because what is the point? And they, if you look at your reviews as well, as an ind you know, particularly as an independent, you're like, okay, I think that's good enough to go. And then you see reviews and you're like, okay, I guess it's still good enough. Um, then, then that's a good um, measure. Obviously, you don't get that till you put it out there. But th the other thing to come back to why I wrote the book on mindset is because it never feels good enough. And that's why we write another book. Yeah. It's like, okay, I did the best I can at that moment. And now I'm moving on to this next story. And I'll do better at dialogue, or I'll do better at character, or I'll do better at setting. Um, so I think that's another tip is just let things go as a part of life there are more words you know this there are more <laughs> words there are a never ending number of ideas so yeah i like moving and being in the stream i think there's a lot of energy comes from moving and that's why i've never actually queried um uh certainly my fiction i queried non-fiction way like 15 years ago um but i i like the energy of putting things out there and starting anew and just moving yeah, that's great advice. I love that. Uh, and, and you've renewed my commitment that this is indeed my final revision. Yes. <laughs> I Go actually have. I actually have tired of it. That's that's one sign that you're done is that you're you're just kind of exhausted. Yes. So, um, yeah. So thanks for that. Um, I'm curious because I, I know you said that good, good editors, you know, it, it, it depends on the novel and how long it is and and, the, you know, a lot of uh, conditions with what the who, who the editor are, editors are in terms of what they'll charge. But what's what's a good ballpark? Because I, I wouldn't know. I'd be throwing a dart, you know, against a wall of different figures if I wanted to hire. Well, an look, to be honest, it's, uh, you know, editors, if any editors are listening, they would kill me for kind of trying to come up with a number because it will very definitely depend. But you you're going to be looking anywhere between, let's say, 500 dollars and two thousand possibly more you know if you if you're if someone's sitting there with a two hundred thousand word fan first draft fantasy novel that they're going to send to an editor that is clearly going to be more expensive than one of my sixty thousand word dark fantasy thrillers from an author who's written 17 novels you know it's going to be a much easier job for an editor to work on my book than it is to work on their book um, and that word count is one thing uh, I mean obviously it's hard to wrangle a 200,000 word manuscript but we know people come out of NaNoWriMo with manuscripts Absolutely. that long <laughs> yeah written in so, a week <laughs> yeah exactly so what I would say to people uh, I also if people are listening and they're new authors um, new writers uh, I know people worry they're like oh if I send it to an editor they're going to steal my work um look that's just it's just not going to happen uh to be blunt your work is probably not that brilliant yet i mean you know it can be polished but also that's the editor's job that's their reputation and that's why you want other authors to recommend editors and to check their references i mean i interview lots of editors on my podcast um you can most editors you know have got very clear guidelines often they will do a test edit as well you can send a sample get a and you'll get a quote you can some of them can talk to you or however i'm an introvert um i've I, I have talked to one of my editors now on skype but you know generally it's all done over email mm -hmm. um but yeah i would say uh, structural edits can be different so it might be called a manuscript assessment some editors will do that or a structural edit will be like a report um so they might read your whole book and then give you a report on what needs to be improved that can be very helpful but of course that doesn't give you a line by line analysis which is the exp very expensive edit but very well worthwhile edit now the other thing is what i would say uh, to people is this is an investment in your writing ability and this is why i continue to pay editors every time i get a book back i learn something that i then feed into my craft my writing craft brain so that next time I don't make that same mistake um, 
And yeah, I mean, and I'm not talking about commas or grammar issues here. I'm right. talking about, you know, character issues or plot or um, pacing, you know, lots of different things that go into the, the crafting of a novel. So if you want to do this for the long term, it's all about improving. I don't believe it is this one magnum opus. I just think that's not the reality of being a professional writer. Um, you know, look at the best loved, most high earning authors in the world, Nora Roberts, Stephen King, James Patterson. These guys write 10 books a year. You know, every, there's a rumor about Stephen King that for every book he publishes, there's one in a drawer because he, he actually writes so fast, but he's still sure. like traditionally published. <laughs> well, if he writes 2,000 words a day, then you just have to do the math on that. He probably exactly. has several books in a drawer. Um, well, I'm curious. So this is a nitty gritty question, but I think if you're serious about self-publishing, obviously you have to consider it. Uh, it seems like formats for books and reading just kind of there's a new format every day. That's not true exactly, but there's like paperback, print, hardback, uh, ebook, uh, audio. Um, you know, I don't know if there's other things as well, but what it, that's kind of overwhelming, certainly for a first time author. What, what formatting considerations, how would you guide people? Okay, well, um, assuming your book is just a narrative prose book without lots of illustrations and tables and things, because obviously that needs some more professional a layout for a print book. Um, but you and I both use Macs and um, there is a wonderful program called Vellum, which I use and many of us use. Um, I've got a tutorial on my website. Maybe we can link to that in the notes. Um, that's what I use for all my ebook formatting. It also does print. It also does large print. Um, Vellum does have a, a one-time fee. So the question is whether or not that's worthwhile purchasing. It's a couple of hundred dollars. Um, what it does mean is you are in control. Now, there will be a typo. If you publish, even if you use four or five editors and beta readers, there will be a typo in your finished book. I mean, you find them in traditionally published books all the time. This is not just an indie thing. So if you want to fix that typo and you do your own formatting, you can fix it really easily and just upload a new book. So I personally still format my ebooks myself. Mm. Um, I actually really enjoy it. Vellum is very enjoyable. It is Mac only, but there is um, there are workarounds for PC using Mac in cloud, um, which people can look up uh, later. Uh, but basically, the, so that's um, ebook. You can also hire formatters. Uh, you can use free formatting tools. So one of the self-publishing, uh, lots of the self-publishing sites have free formatting tools. Kindle has its own free formatting tool for ebooks. Uh, Draft to Digital, um, that's draft number two digital.com have a whole load of free formatting tools uh, readsy has formatting tools and they also have editors and things like that so there are lots of places you can get free options um then you get the premium options like vellum then you can also pay professional formatters it might cost you 50 between 50 and 200 dollars to get uh ebook formatted um for print, uh, and also obviously you need a cover design. Again, all these freelancers are hireable and authors recommend them. It is not hard to find these people now. Uh, mm -hmm. Good people, excellent people, many of whom actually design for traditional publishing as well. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of the formatting. I do have worked with a professional formatter for my print books, um, which if you're on the video, you can see behind me. Um, so I like to have a professional do that because mainly I'm just, I just don't care about things like where the page number is and what little filigree thing goes on this page. Some people really care and my designer cares. Um, so I like her to do my print formats because I like them to look nice. Um, but you can do your own in vellum, as I said. Um, so there are lots of ways. It depends on your personality, depends on how techy you are, if you want to do it yourself, or you can just hire someone. So it's all good. Yeah, that's great. And thanks for mentioning that you have those free resources on your site. Um, I know that Catherine's going to put those uh, links in the, the chat, but uh, I'll just read your site too. It's the creative pen, pen with two ends.com. And I know it's a, it's a site rich in resources. So definitely guide people there. And, and, you know, you mentioned, um, it's, I love that you format your own books. That's inspiring. Uh, they only <laughs> Book I've self-published. I actually hired someone to do it as an ebook, but that was a long time ago. Um, I'm curious though, because the, one of the wraps on self-published books is that you can tell a self-published book often by the cover design, and so it's a matter that cover designing, a good cover design, is a real art. Uh, it might look easy, but it's a real art. So, what advice do you have for people with their cover designs? 
yeah well it mainly is hire a professional <laughs> and um, as I said a lot of the um, a few I mean I'm sure you remember there was a big sort of culling and uh, in the traditional publishing world and they laid off a lot of their full-time designers full-time editors so which is why we can now hire them um, and uh, yeah so you can just hire a professional cover designer and that is the best way again it's going to cost you a few hundred dollars um, to get someone and the best um, you can buy off the shelf covers actually now um, some of the designers will kind of design a whole load of them uh, within certain genres um, and it can actually be a really good way to get ideas for titles and, and stuff like that and, and ideas for books uh, so yeah pre-made covers would be one um, ebook only covers you can also get on canva canva.com for free ebook only and they've got some pretty nice covers on canva um, but as I said if you are ready to invest and get a really nice professional cover um, then you will need to spend a bit of money the other thing with all these professionals is that you do need to book them in advance so don't just go oh I'm going to publish tomorrow so I guess I'll send it to my editor today and ask this cover designer uh, no you're going to need some lead time on this um, the other thing is <sighs> One of the wonderful things about being indie is you can change your covers, you can redo the book, you can unpublish the book, you can re-edit the book and upload it later. You have the freedom to do all that. You are in control. So my first three books, um, the first, my NaNoWriMo book that year was called Pentecost, and I wrote Prophecy and Exodus were the first three books in my um, Arcane series. And then in 2015, so like three years later after I'd finished them, I um, re-edited, re recovered, republished with new titles. So now they're Stone of Fire, Crypt of Bone, Ark of Blood, which are much more thrillery, um, mm -hmm. action adventure, Dan Brownie type uh, titles, which is what the books are. So because I, when we start out, we don't know the publishing industry, you know, we're writing a novel because that's what we want to do. But if you're going to be a successful independent publisher, you'd also need to learn how to publish <laughs> and yeah. how to market. And that book packaging is so important. But why I say this is because it's very hard to do yourself. It is very hard. Um, but don't worry, if you get it wrong, you can just sort it out later. So no worries. Yeah, that's inspiring that you can uh, change things. Um, and, and definitely that you uh, don't have to know everything yourself. You just have to know who to go to and how to find them and then how to work with them, right? Yes, and I, I mean, I pretty much have everything on my website for free these days, so you can go, go yeah. find it all out. Because, you know, what? I, one of my goals when I first started doing this was to help a million books be born in the world. So, you know, I'm just really keen for people to get their work out there. And, you know, the, the, this could, putting your book in the world will change your life. It may not sell millions. My first book did not. <laughs> it really did not do that. But it changed my life and set me on a new course and a new direction. And that's what I think writing a book does. It may not change the world, but it will certainly change you. Yeah, that's great to hear. That's what we want to do with NaNoWriMo as well. Absolutely. So we share, we share missions. Um, I'm going to ask one more question. And we got a bunch of questions that are streaming in from the chat window. But uh, oftentimes when I uh, go check out a book, an indie book on Amazon, I'll see the publisher listed as CreateSpace, the, the self-publishing company. Um, and and I, I, I know that it's so easy that you can, just, you can just create your own imprint out of your imagination. You can just choose a word. It's that easy, right? And, and what would your advice be to people for, for, their, for creating their own imprint? Yeah, well, firstly, Create Space is no longer. It is right. now K KDP Print, um, in case people are wondering. Uh, but two, I don't believe most people are like you, Grant. I don't believe most people shop by publisher. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah I think exactly. This is the most important thing. It really doesn't matter. Um, and I know traditionally published authors who've self-published and they haven't put anything in that field and it will just say Amazon Publishing or it will say, you know, not Am Amazon Publishing is a publishing company. It will right. say whatever, KDP print um but it so i don't think readers care if your book uh looks professional and it's good and it's great for the reader then they don't care mm. the reason to consider an imprint i believe is if you want bookstores libraries literary festivals uh foreign rights publishers if you want to take things to the next level having an imprint gives you a publisher and rights holder i mean we don't really have the time to go into intellectual property rights which is the heart of the business 
honest. Um, but what we do with licensing is we license those rights. So I set up Curl Up Press in 2015. So um, way, you know, seven years after I self-published my first book um, because I decided I wanted to do that um, f publishing more professional publishing arm where I now reach out to bookstores, libraries, universities, etc. And some of my books are stocked in all those places um, but you that's certainly a more advanced tactic and not something you need to worry about you also don't need to start a business to self-publish a book um, you know you, you don't have to use your real name if you self-publish there's the, all these different fields you you can keep your legal name separate to your author name so you can do pseudonyms that kind of thing um, I want people to feel like you really do have many choices but also you can change things later you can change all of these things later and learn Learn as you go. So please don't think you need to know everything right now. You just need to take that first step. And for most people, uh, it's going to be get an editor, as you said. And if they want to go indie, it will be publish an ebook on Amazon. Like that's the first step. And then then there's might be the print book, and then there might be the library, and then there might be the audio book, and then you know it goes on and on. This is a wonderful career. You can do all these things. But please uh, start where you are and start at the beginning and learn as you go. Good reminder because there's so much to know that can easily you can easily create an obstacle for yourself. I can imagine because yes, a block. We're not having any blocks around here. Yeah, <laughs> definitely because you, you you do become a type of publishing house unto yourself once you become a person like you. Uh, but to get there, like that was 11 years ago that you first or published your or longer, I guess, when you first published your first book. So it's a long time to learn about things. Yes, exactly. I started writing properly in 2006, put my first book out 2008 before the Kindle, if you can yeah. believe it. So um, yeah, and I ha I've got so many things wrong. Most of my books ended up in a landfill. Um, but the lessons I learned at that point are the things that have enabled me to get to where I am now. And I left my day job in 2011. So uh, I guess I'm oh next year, I'll be, I'll be a decade as a full time writer. Um, so it, it can certainly be done. But yes, you just have to learn along the way. Congratulations on that. I'm going to start with some uh, questions from our uh, attendees. Uh, Carla H. asked the big question, how do you get distribution as an indie author? Uh, well, you basically just have to upload your book to the various sites. So um, eBooks, obviously Amazon, you just upload to Amazon. Um, then you can use distributors. You can get, I go direct to Kobo. I also go direct to Apple, but you can use distributors like Drafter Digital, Smashwords, Publish Drive, to get to uh, ebook retailers all over the world. Uh, for print books, you use KDP Print for Amazon print. So you can order my books on Amazon. Um, and then you can use Ingram Spark for distribution to bookstores, um, libraries, universities. They have 39,000 outlets around the world. Uh, and then audiobooks, um, I use acx.com and findawayvoices.com again to get global distribution. So my books are in 190 countries at this point. And as Grant said, I've sold in 86. So the point with being an indie is we are not printing them and send it, putting them in warehouses. That's not the business model. The business model is we do print on demand for print, which is we upload our files. Then if a customer orders and that customer might be a bookstore, I had some orders in Michigan the other day, um, or it might be someone on Amazon. And then the books are printed and shipped directly to that customer. It is the most uh, environmentally friendly way of publishing. It also means you don't have to pay anything up front. You just get money later. So it's a very good business model. But you have to think about distribution entirely differently than you would as a traditional publisher. Yeah, wow, a lot to learn. Uh, Sarah Lyle asks, uh, any advice for publishing a set of novels written by students? So I think this would be on a smaller scale, uh, not for a blockbuster bestseller novel, but something that students could have and maybe get for their family. Yes, yeah, so I don't know how old these students are, um, but I, I mentioned... Yeah, I mentioned intellectual property rights before. Um, there is a reason that there are contracts with, for a publishing contract. If you're publishing other people's work under your own name, then I would suggest you at least have something in writing because what's going to happen if you do it for for profit? This is the other question. Is it for profit? Are you just doing it for cost? Are you just going to, for example, if you just wanted to, for, to load up some students' books and get them printed, you could just use a local printer for that. You don't need to sell books on Amazon. 
But if you want to sell those books on Amazon and there will be money received, then you need some, I would say you need some kind of contract, even like a basic email that is, is an agreement, especially in America, people. <laughs> um, um, but I don't let that stop you. But I just want you to consider what being a publisher and putting that through your own account might mean. Um, but if you're, I have helped um, school children, uh, my niece um, particularly, do a book on Blurb. So um, B L U R B dot com. They actually have a whole area for children's publishing and charity publishing. So they may have options there for um, that kind of situation. But yeah, I would just, um, what you don't want, for example, is for the book to become a runaway success and for you to get a million dollars in your bank account and then get sued by some parent in the school. <laughs> so just, these days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it can happen. Absolutely. One so of those yeah, just might be a YouTube celebrity. <laughs> exactly. So just be um, be aware of what you're doing when you publish. This is true for anything. You Once you upload your book, anyone in the world can buy it. And it might be, as you say, a runaway success, or no one will find it at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for mentioning Blurb. And I say that because we actually have a partnership with Blurb uh, where they give a discount uh, for exactly this, teachers helping students publish their books. And uh, you can find more about that discount on our Young Writers Program site. Uh, so just Google Young Writers Program, NaNoWriMo, and you'll find it on the site. So um, this next question, um, People are interested in marketing issues, which we haven't talked about, but Pooja Goosh, Gosh says, if you're self-publishing, how early do you need to start marketing your book? Um, after writing it or midway through it? Any guidance? Uh, well, again, this really depends on what kind of book it is, on what your plans are, what your goals are. Um, for example, if you are writing a non-fiction book and you intend and you have a podcast, talk about it as soon as you have an idea. Um, or if it, nonfiction is much, much easier to market because it's very clear. Like if I'm writing um, a book on career change, my first book was on career change. I started a blog on career change uh, while I was writing the book. So when the book came out, there were some people who could buy the book. But if you're writing a novel, especially your first novel, uh, in fact, I reckon until book five, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> and in fact, at book five, I changed my author name. So again, you can change all these things. Um, I changed genres, I changed covers, I changed everything. So for me with fiction, I don't think you necessarily know what that book is going to be until it's ready. So I normally say to writers writing their first novel, don't do anything until you've finished a first draft. If you haven't finished a first draft, just forget publishing and marketing, literally forget about it because most writers will never finish a first draft. I mean, this <laughs> seriously, this is the truth, people. Like finishing a first draft means someone could sit down and read it end to end and it's a, a book, it, you know, it might need some work, but it's, you know, end to end. Most people never get to that point. So why would you bother marketing um, anything? And there is an obsession with marketing. But look, to be honest, you, like I said, I hit the New York Times and USA Today five years after that first book was published with that book, because it's much easier to do marketing once your book has reviews on it. So what I would say is it will, the question can't really be answered specifically because everyone is in a different position. But but um, if you're just starting to write, don't worry about it now. Um, but if you have, if you're working through your final um, draft with an editor, then yeah, I would be looking at starting to figure out your marketing. But also understand that marketing one book is incredibly difficult. And most of us write in series because it's much easier to market a series. Um, and yeah, it all compounds. So again, you can learn this over time. Yeah, great answer. Uh, this one comes from Penny Kenya Cat. And um, the question is, you know, NaNoWriMo is great as a community to connect writers. Do you have any communities within the self-publishing or indie author community to recommend? And how can people, you know, find other indie publishers to learn from? Yeah, sure. Well, obviously, there are tons of Facebook groups. Uh, I'm personally in the Alliance of Independent Authors, which is a professional membership, um, has an amateur membership if you haven't published yet. But the Alliance of Independent Authors, um, we have a Facebook group where you can ask questions and there are lots of indies in there from all over the world. Um, so that's a really good one. There are also, um, I'll recommend 20 books to 50k. Now that is very much for um, genre fiction. 
and is highly focused on money and Amazon. <laughs> um, so I'm less involved with that because I publish wide. I like money, but I don't um, I don't write fast. Those some people in there are writing, you know, a book a month or, or more. So that that's a quite a high, high volume. Uh, self-publishing wing and that is one of the business models but there are many business models of indie uh, so yeah and I also uh, SPF self-publishing formula which is um, as a podcast a self-publishing show um, they have a forum there's lots of sites now that have um, groups and courses and things. I mean, we really are in this sort of heyday of of indie. But yeah, for me, it's the Alliance of Independent Authors. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, this next question is, is, is interesting because we haven't talked about these platforms. Uh, the question is, what do you feel about online serial publishers like Dream, Thick Fun, Wattpad, Paid Stories, and Radish who pay per read? Do you consider this real publishing as it's put in this question <laughs> real publishing well yeah. as soon as you put your words in the world you are real publishing i mean we are like on tv right now <laughs> yeah. um we are real publishing uh so yes as soon as you put your words out into the world where someone else can read them you are real publishing you're not you're not you don't have a book <laughs> so some people use the word author when it comes to an actual finished book um but you're certainly publishing um now i know Wattpad and I have books on Wattpad. Uh, it's an extremely good community, but it's a community, a bit like YouTube where, where this is going out. It is a social site and you get a lot of feedback. And the people who do best on Wattpad uh, are in the community, they're chatting, they're networking, they're writing with other writers. And um, I, I feel it skews younger, so a sort of YA, although they have tens of millions of people on there and it's a, a wonderful platform they also have a publishing arm and they have a they work with Hollywood studios now so Wattpad certainly I know uh is fantastic um I uh, and you can publish your book separately Wattpad is not a publishing platform as in it doesn't compete with Amazon you're not selling your books on Amazon, whereas something like Radish, I believe I haven't used it myself, but as you said, if you're paid per read, per, per page, that's more like a subscription, which is what sites like Scribd, um, uh, KDP Unlimited, uh, Kindle Unlimited, uh, there's lots of these subscription programs. But yeah, anytime you are publishing your writing on a platform, you're going to click a button with terms and services on. Now I mentioned contracts before, and you need to read that contract if you click it online just as much as if you were signing it a piece of paper because those terms and conditions will tell you what you are agreeing to. So I can't personally recommend that you use any of those sites because I haven't seen those terms and conditions recently. <laughs> um, but what I would do is just check, you know, what are they actually asking for? If you publish your work on this site, do they own it? Uh, can they put it in a book and sell it without your permission? Some of these sites, you know, are not necessarily in your best interest. So please just check the terms and conditions. I can vouch for Wattpad. I'm going to vouch for them. Um, but I'm not sure about the others because I haven't used them. Yeah. And I was going to say Wattpad, I know people have also developed a community or platform through mm. platforms like that. So why they might, might not be getting paid, uh, they are developing like a, a lot of readers who are interested in their work and what they have them to say. Uh, this next question, uh, I, I, I know the answer to this, I believe, but I'm, I'm curious to hear yours. Is it easier to come back from a failed book that you've self that has been traditionally published? <laughs> okay, well, first of all, the definition of failure is a personal one if you are an indie. Uh, you could say that my first book failed miserably, as in I told you, I, I printed a thousand books, sold 200 of them to people I physically met and the rest went in a landfill. You could say that's a failure. You know, I spent thousands on that and I got ripped off and all the all the bad things happened. And yet that book turned into the thing that got me where I am today. So failure is um, a lesson learned. What I will say about traditional publishing is that this is where the number of books sold can be very important. So um, there are people who get, you know, a big advance. They don't earn out. 
and they kind of have a death spiral where their next book doesn't get bought or their advance is lower and then you know it becomes difficult and then what sometimes happens is those authors relaunch under another name I know a lot of professional authors who are on like their third pen name because the other ones death spiraled um, so they've tried again with another name this is very common in traditional publishing they're like this is a debut or in fact um girl on the train was you know billed as a debut but she had written three books under another name before that um just in a different genre so the a failure <laughs> failure is can be rectified by changing your name and doing it again, um, not a problem. What you have to think is, do I love this enough and what can I learn from this so I don't end up in that situation next time? Is that what you were gonna say, Grant? Uh, yeah, essentially. Um, you said it much better than I would have said it, so I was so happy <laughs> you said it. I, I do think that there, yeah, the, the, the traditional publishing, um, Th those numbers, the sales of your first book or your book can really determine your fate with a particular publisher and in the industry these days because they can look up how many books you sold and that will determine your advance or they might decline it because of that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think it's, it's, it's tricky sometimes. There's a lot of pressure on the book uh, depending on what the put or didn't put behind behind it. And sometimes you can't, you can't, that's not an excuse. Like you can say, oh, it didn't sell well because you didn't put much marketing behind it, but that doesn't really matter. They're looking at the end sale. Um, so it's just a different landscape to navigate. Um, and, and authors should kind of know that going in, that they need to, they really need to make that book, book a success. They need to help hustle as much as any, any, any author. Uh, but I love your perspective really in the end about uh, failure being on, on, a, on a spectrum and it's subjective and you need to decide what a failure or success is. And, and again, like those, this is the thing about creativity. Creativity, success relies on failures <laughs> or failures with quotes around it. You know, you've got to take risks. You've got to put yourself out there. And those supposed failures might be the most important thing you do along the way. So, yeah. Um, and we're all learning. Look, I really want to keep stressing that, you know, we're all learning and learning new skills all the time. Like I'm looking at writing an audio drama at the moment. The first draft is appalling. I know this, but, you know, I have to give it a go because I really want to do audio drama. And, you know, we. this is why I love being a writer. There's always something new to learn. And so that's why I want people to reframe failure. And also what I love about being an indie is the empowerment. I know everything is in my control. I have no one to blame except myself. So I make sure I do the things that I care about and spend time on the things I want to write. And then I publish and then I market and, you know, I, I get my stuff out there. But from and from everything I hear about traditional publishing, so much of it is out of your control. As yeah. you say, if your book death spirals, it's not it might not be your fault, but that is against your you know, your brand in that situation. Whereas I know everything I do is is up to me. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, as you mentioned audiobooks, uh, Bat Advocate asks, how expensive is it to publish an audiobook? And we were talking about this before we came on, just how audiobooks are, are, are becoming so popular and emerging. You know, every year the sales go up uh, tremendously. So, and, but we were also saying that, you know, uh, an audiobook isn't necessarily the first thing an author needs to learn about as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, what? What I would say is that the audiobook, um, you can do royalty split deals with narrators, but what I would say is most narrators now will only do that if they are new narrators. Um, so like you'll be new together and you'll split the royalties, but it might not end up making money for anyone. Um, the, you, really, you only do an audiobook if you have more of an established brand or if you have a way to market that audiobook. For example, you're going on podcasts or you have a podcast. If you're doing any kind of audio marketing, then having an audiobook is a really good idea but in terms of the cost it is free if you do a royalty split so the royalty split means the narrator does it for free but you sign a contract for seven years and the money is split between you you can do that on acx and on findawayvoices.com um, then if you pay outright it can be anything between 100 to say 500 us dollars per finished hour and it's around 9,000 words per hour 
So what's great about nonfiction, for example, a short nonfiction book might be only three or four hours, so it won't cost you too much money. And yet I find personally nonfiction sells really well, um, because, mainly because I have a podcast that markets, markets it, um, whereas my fiction costs more money to create and sells less well because I don't really have um, a way to market those uh, so much. So just be aware that the success of audio depends on a lot of different things and the money will depend on how long it is and what kind of deal you do. Again, a lot of this is contracts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> become a contract specialist. <laughs> Oh, definitely. If you want to be a successful author, you do need to read your contracts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's just horrible reading, I have to say. Oh, uh, no, I love, I'm going to reframe that and say them? it's wonderful reading because that is your money. <laughs> okay, good. That's the motivation. <laughs> yeah. Um, this question, next question, we haven't talked about this, pricing of books. Uh, Brielle McLean asks, what would you price for print and ebook debut YA fantasy novel? Uh, I, I can't comment on that particular genre. What I suggest you do is go to that genre on Amazon and have a look at what the top selling books are doing uh, as indies, if you're publishing indie. Um, also, ebooks you can price between uh, $2.99 and $9.99 US dollars and get your 70% royalty. But if you go outside of that, you'll get 30, 35%, whatever it is. Um, so there is a cap within Amazon on ebook pricing. Print pricing will depend on how long the book is and you upload your book and then they will tell you how much it will cost and then you add your profit onto that um what i normally do is just at, make sure i make two two dollars or two pounds or three dollars for every book sold um just because i like getting paid uh but you can decide that as well so yes you get to set your pricing but for ebooks certainly i would look at other books in your niche then also consider promotional pricing so for example if you price it higher let's say you go with a, a 5.99 or something or a 4.99 then you can do a 99 cent deal uh, a month later or something and you can do good um, marketing that way so that pricing is a marketing strategy as well as your income and it's pretty complicated uh, yeah. but again you can change it and you have control of your price as an indie so you can switch it up now I know I know some indie authors there's there's they, they give away books right they give away books to get people hooked like their first book in a series might be free Mm. How does that exactly work? How do you do that? Because you mentioned the whole royalty structure. Uh, well, see, haha. <laughs> on Am on every other site except Amazon, you can price free. So I, my book Stone of Fire, that first novel, uh, is free uh, on every platform as an ebook. And if you can, you can just mark it as zero on every site except Amazon. But what Amazon does is price match. So Amazon will price match your zero, and thus the book is free on Amazon. If you are in KDP Select, you also get five free days a month. So you, uh, every ninety day period. Period, sorry, not per month, per 90 days. So you can put books to free on Amazon for a short amount of time, or you can use the price match thing mm -hmm. if you go wide. Great. Um, well, we're running out of time here, but so I'm going to open it up to one question. I think that's just a big, good question for us all to ponder. Uh, Zoe G asks, what would you say to an aspiring teen writer who wants to publish? Oh, I'm so pleased we have a, a teen writer. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say awesome you know totally go for it and please don't let anything stop you and we're just in this wonderful environment i would suggest wattpad actually go and have a look at wattpad um the young writers program obviously nano writer rimo young writers program what i would say is uh, and I, I will get a bit tearful here because when I was a teenager, someone told me that my writing wasn't good enough and I shouldn't write. And I basically wrote a horror story um, at my school. I was about 14, 15, and it, I wrote a horror thing and they said it wasn't what I should be writing. And I didn't write fiction for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So please don't let that happen to you. Please, whatever you are writing, if it's horrible, if it's violent, if it's things that people don't think are good enough, please write anyway, um, because people will try and, and if, in fact, even if you're not a teenager, please don't, please write what you want, because we all feel fear of judgment, we feel fear of failure, we all feel these things, but we are writers, like this is what we do, and if you feel the urge to write, then please, please get your words out there, and um, you know, we are all supporting you uh, out here, yeah. you know, and we want your book in the world, so um, yeah, and if you're not getting support from home, try 
try your teachers, um, try online communities that are safe um, for, for people. Um, and yeah, please do write. That was said so eloquently, perfectly said, Joanna. Um, I want to echo everything Joanna said, um, and uh, yeah, and say that yeah, that 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 story that you related. I, unfortunately, every writer I know has gone through a moment like that where somebody has just torn them down uh, unnecessarily. It's happened to me as well, and it's it's it doesn't matter if you're a teen or an adult. It's it's likely to happen. But you gave the perfect words. Is just put that try to get over it as much as hard as that is and keep writing and believe in yourself as a writer because that's really important um i'll just i, I don't want to plug products here but we do have a book called brave, brave the page that just came out uh in 2019 and it's specifically for teen writers so we hope that everyone will brave the page whether they read the book or not um, and thank you joanna for helping us brave the page and also for braving the world beyond the page for getting the book out in the world and sharing it which i also think if that's what you want to do it's it's a wonderful thing to have someone read your work and respond to it. I think it's so valuable. Yeah. So thank well, you so much. Oh, well, thanks so much for having me. And um, yeah, I'm at thecreativepen.com and my podcast is The Creative Pen and the successful self-publishing ebook is free on all platforms. So people can go um, check that out as well if you want to have a look at those next steps. But yeah, thanks so much. And I really wish everyone the best with their writing. Thanks so much, Joanna. Bye-bye. Good luck, everyone. Keep writing. Bye.